Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth in the series, our hot talks in mediation. Um, I see some familiar faces. Hello, Ola. Um, everybody, the, for the new people. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Oh, there. For the new people, if you go down to the um, the icons at the bottom and click the globe, you can you can uh, click down to Ukrainian. Um, but today we're really excited. Bruce is going to be introducing our guest speakers. But I just want to say that we're really excited to hear from them about using community-based sociotherapy to reunite communities after conflict. And what they're doing and what they've done is really amazing. So I'm excited about this. And with that, I will turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Susan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. It's great to be back together uh, in our continuing series. Uh, rest assured that uh, recent world events have not distracted us from our mission with our friends in Ukraine. Uh, it's only brought home the uh, renewed urgency for the mission that we're on together, looking for ways to resolve conflict through peaceful means. Um, as Susan indicated, in just a couple minutes, I'm going to introduce our guests as we begin a conversation about community-based sociotherapy and what it is and what it has to offer our friends in Ukraine. Um, I, a couple things first. I was reminded um, of kind of the long-term consequences of war, maybe brought home uh, to me uh, most compelling way when I first met a woman, uh, Dr. Celia Elworthy, um, who was a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee uh, and wrote a, has written a number of books, including one called A Business Plan for Peace. And I had the privilege of interviewing her one year on stage uh, at the International Academy of Mediators Conference in Scotland. And in that conversation, she said something that took me uh, some reflection to get my head around, which is that it takes three generations for the impact of war and trauma associated with war to dissipate from a particular community. And that long-term impact of war uh, was something that I really had never truly contemplated. Uh, and then a second sort of moment of revelation occurred uh, in teaching with a, a neurobiologist uh, from the University of California, Los Angeles, Dr. Daniel Siegel, who introduced me to this concept of epigenetics, this idea that our environment, and particularly stressors in our environment like war or post-war trauma, uh, can actually impact the expression of our DNA, meaning that it can transmit trauma and anxiety into future generations. And both of those things together combined to get me thinking about both the long-term consequences of war and trauma, but more particularly, what could be done to interrupt that cycle? What could be done? What could we do to impact that uh, those premises that war by definition would carry forward so many years? And so I'm delighted today to uh, be able to introduce our guests, um, uh, Angela and Diogene, uh, who have uh, embarked on this uh, incredible mission uh, that we're gonna share with you today in offering an idea about uh, one potential solution community-based sociotherapy, which they'll describe momentarily. Um, and then as, as before I sort of begin this dialogue with them, I'll make one other commentary. The goal here is not to compare uh, events, not to compare traumas. Every war is different. Every impact on communities is different. But the threads that bind us as human beings and the threads that run through our shared suffering offer opportunities for us to learn from each other in terms of what we've gone through. And so I just encourage you to listen to what could work within your communities, to pass through a filter of what's uniquely Ukrainian, those things that you hear today and beyond, and, 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 and think about ways to make use of those going forward. So we're gonna begin with a conversation and we're gonna introduce our guests. We're gonna go through a conversation of what they have been doing in Rwanda. Uh, and what it uh, suggests might be lessons for other uh, countries and other cultures in conflict. And we're gonna leave time for questions as well. So uh, feel free to uh, make lists of questions that you have and I'll help uh, uh, those questions get answered as we move through the conversation. Okay, um, to our guests, 
Uh, Angela Diogen, uh, welcome. Uh, good evening. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for your um, willingness to share your experiences, your lessons with our friends from Ukraine. Um, and what I'd like to do is just very briefly uh, have you introduce yourselves. And Angela, if I could start with you. Uh, briefly, how did you come to this uh, uh, process of, of uh, rebuilding communities? Give us a little taste of your background, please. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much for offering us this space. It's also really a unique opportunity for us to share the experiences uh, here from Rwanda and uh, also to learn uh, from you, from the audience. So for me, my name is Angela Janssen. Um, and actually, uh, when I was a child, when, uh, when I was nine years old, that's when uh, the genocide here in Rwanda happened. And I really clearly remember watching the images at the television at that time. And like Dujan, my colleague now, and we have been working for 10 years uh, together, was about the same age being here in Rwanda. So I really also feel very privileged actually to work with uh, Diogen. And I remember that 10 years after uh, the genocide, I watched a documentary about uh, a man and um, that man was um, forced actually to kill his wife during the genocide. He was from a Hutu background. And when the rebels came to his house, um, he forced, he said to his wife, please hide in the garden. Um, and then um, I'll make sure that they go away. And every day he paid them, he paid them and they, they went away. Until one day they came back, the Interahamwe, the rebel groups, and they said, you have to show us where your wife is. We know that she's still here or otherwise we're going to kill your children. And the wife was in the back and she came to the front and she said, please do it because you need to save our children. And he really said somehow a kind of power came over me. It felt like a power of God or anything, any power came over me to really, yeah, at that moment, kill my wife to protect my, my children. And that story that had, had touched me so much, I was at that time 19 years old. And I really felt um, also then actually um, his daughter, was interviewed. It was then 10 years later after the genocide and she had seen her father killing the wife and then also for him to, to be in prison then. He was just released after he got interviewed. And I really felt somehow that I, I wanted to go to Rwanda and, and learn about how to deal with, with these terrible consequences and these complexities of of the genocide and the impact of the genocide also on the future generations. And um, yeah, that's when I went to Rwanda. I was 21 years old. I, I, I went to the, actually I did my bachelor studies, my research in the prison. I spoke to many, especially women who participated in the genocide. And uh, yeah, since then Rwanda really is in my heart. And I, uh, yeah, some years later in 2012, so 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I uh, came back here and I was an intern at the Dutch embassy. And then that's when I came across some people um, participating in, uh, in social therapy, community-based social therapy. They had just started this program at a very small scale and they brought together groups of people, both genocide survivors and genocide perpetrators who were released from prison. And um, yeah, I was part of that conversation, which was yeah, really feeling like this is something that's, that needs to be extended so, to so many communities in Rwanda, because at that point, people said, well, for our group, we, we went one direction, to fetch water and the other group made sure that they they went in another direction just to make sure that they would not come across each other and still living in the same communities but every day their purpose was to see how they could not meet each other how they could just make sure that they would not come across one another and in those social therapy sessions that's when they really honestly had to speak to each other about what happened because all in all they were meeting each other on a, on a daily basis so there was no way to avoid each other so and in those groups they really had this space where they could talk about the past where they could 
kind of come, come together. And that was so unique and special to me to see it. That's when I thought, okay, this is really an approach that I feel we should try to see how to extend it. And yeah, that's now 11 years later, we've expanded the approach uh, with many of our colleagues, not me, but many others really took uh, a forefront role to make sure that it would be expanded in Rwanda. And at the moment we're expanding to DRC, to Burundi, to Uganda, to um, uh, South Sudan and different countries, especially at the moment it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there are also requests from Yemen, from um, Indonesia. So yeah, I'm really... Angela, let me, let me put, yes, have you pause for a moment. Your, your passion is evident and thank you for sharing all of that. I do want to come back to many of the points that you have raised more slowly and to build on them in just a few moments. Uh, let me pause for just a moment and ask uh, uh, Diogen uh, to introduce himself as well and how Diogen came to be working with you in this important project. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I'm, uh, I'm Diogen. Uh, I was born in Rwanda and uh, I grew up also in, in, uh, in the same community. Uh, during genocide, I was a very little boy. Uh, of course, we lost uh, many people uh, in my family, my, my own family. But I, I didn't really feel losing only uh, my family members, but I also lost connections. Uh, with uh, many people, the neighbors and, uh, and also friends. Um, of course, that time, because I was a very little boy, uh, so I could not, uh, I could see what was happening, but I could not understand fully uh, what was going on, why was it happening. So I was really in a total confusion. So I could see things happening, but without really a good understanding on why and how uh, it goes uh, in that way. Uh, so then uh, after genocide, um, so I, uh, I was with my, my relatives. So I was uh, the oldest in the family. So then I had to take care of my family members. Uh, I mean, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, so taking care of everything concerning their lives. So. Uh, later, um, I joined social therapy in 2013. That's when I started to work with Angela. But we had also met before uh, in uh, another different conversation. And later we, we met again uh, just to work on the same project. Um, so I, I really took uh, uh, social therapy from, from, from that time as a really good school for me because it helped me to understand uh, myself and also understand my family and understand more my community. And also it raised my interest to really see how I can contribute to my own future, the future of my family and also the future of, um, of my community. So then I'm working for the community-based social therapy from 2013 up to today. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, Angela, when we spoke last week, you said something that stuck with me, and I've been thinking about it ever since. You said that just because war is declared over, it doesn't end in the hearts of people. Can you explain that uh, statement a little bit more and how it relates to uh, community-based um, uh, sociotherapy? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, uh, it was the statement of my colleague, um, Diogène. So I, I would gladly give over to him, yes. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, of course, as we said, uh, 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 declaring that uh, the war uh, has ended, or let us, uh, if we take an example of genocide uh, in Rwanda, uh, of course, uh, the time came and it was stopped. It was said to be stopped, uh, but uh, social therapy also, when I joined social therapy, uh, I really realized that though uh, the genocide was stopped, uh, it didn't stop in the hearts of people. So it is something that uh, remained, it stayed, and it really continued, co continued in, in, in our minds, in our hearts, and uh, people were still feeling um, anger, 
uh, uh, hatred and uh, some having the feelings of revenge, uh, some feeling what they cannot even understand. So people had different feelings, be it uh, on the side of, uh, of the survivors uh, or on the side of the perpetrators, even the bystanders. People had really different uh, feelings and uh, you could, and even today, you can really see that there's really something that is still going on. Of course, the genocide stopped. Of course, the war stops. But there's also something that goes beyond uh, beyond that, and people keep living it. And uh, it's really important that people uh, think of how to also stop that war, how to stop that genocide that keeps going after the war or after genocide. Yeah. Thank you, Diyushin. Um, yeah, Angela, before we get much further, would you explain uh, to all of our guests, all of those listening, what is community-based sociotherapy and particularly why? I always tell people, if you can understand the why, it's the best place to start. Why is it so valuable? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, actually, community-based social therapy really focuses on the nexus between psychosocial well-being and mental health and peace building. And we build on the capacities and the resources of the communities themselves. So what's uh, community-based social therapy does is instead of working with professionals who have a psychology back, a background in psychology or social workers um, to work with the community members and train them to facilitate social therapy groups and in these groups they invite members of the community of whom they think they can benefit from the approach and from being member of the group and they invite 15 people from the community generally. And together they go through different phases of a period of 15 weeks. And they go through phases of uh, building safety, building trust, caring for each other, uh, building uh, respect. And then the fifth phase is about new life orientations. Um, and then the last phase is about uh, memories, processing, painful memories, but also the, uh, remembering good things of the past. So that are the steps the groups go through together, um, being yeah, facilitated by the community members themselves, because what is so important is that they know really what happened in the communities, and they know the people uh, who are part of the communities, with whom they are in conflict, for example, or who is living in social isolation. You can send a, a psychologist here from Kigali, the capital town, to the rural areas. Then they have a session together. The, the, social ther or the psychologist uh, comes back to Kigali, but the people there in the community still need to live together. So that one-on-one -on -one session, for example, that doesn't really help in, build, in rebuilding the social connections in the communities that were so much destroyed by what happened to during the, the genocide and in the period before and after. So, so let me make sure that I'm understanding as well. Uh, um, it's an opportunity to bring together people from the community uh, to try and reconstruct the fabric of that community one, one group at a time. And you do it by creating this safe space for dialogue led by a local community trained uh, person, uh, a facilitator of some sort. And you go through these uh, steps, these stages of, of, of education and training uh, that um, <clears throat> talks about uh, building trust in the first instance, well, building safety in the first instance, but yeah. building on that with, to build trust, uh, to encourage dialogue directly, uh, and ultimately to get to a point where people can talk openly and honestly about feelings, about memories, about painful events that really help them in this healing process. Do I, do I understand that generally? Yes, nope. you actually summarized it much better than I did, yes. <laughs> and I think maybe also the uniqueness of the approach, because it started uh, 18 years ago, um, is that it really brought together people with different backgrounds. So there was a kind of taboo on it, 
they said, no, no, you can't bring genocide survivors and people who participated in the genocide together in, in one group. That's just impossible. But social therapy was, I think, the first approach in Rwanda who really tried it. And it's, and it's, yeah, it has proven to be so helpful and effective because like I said before, people are already living in the same community together. So they need to live together. But if you are no longer speaking to one another, yeah, then how can you move, how can you progress as a community and indeed restore the social fabric? So yeah, I think that's a unique element of, uh, of CBS. Great. Um, who is involved in the facilitation of these group conversations and what kind of training do they have? Uh, uh, the facilitation of, uh, of groups uh, is done, of course, by people we select from their own communities. So we don't take people from other communities to facilitate groups in, uh, in, uh, in other communities. We do believe that there are really uh, enough resources, there are really enough wisdom, there are enough expertise uh, in the same community that we need to use uh, in the healing of the social relations of, uh, of people in the same community. So what we do, uh, we select uh, some people in that community uh, of course, we do recognize that they are also wounded because they share the same experiences with, uh, uh, with their own communities. Because some come from the, the families of the perpetrators, some comes from the family of, of uh, survivors, and uh, uh, some come from the family of, of bystanders. So they come from different communities, and some others are also the young generation. Uh, which has also been or they feel affected by the past of their families. So then we bring them together in a training with two purposes. One is to uh, give them some essential knowledge uh, to be able to facilitate the group and understand the group dynamics. Uh, but also during that training, recognizing that they are also wounded healers, we also take them through the same process they experience what they are going to do with the groups. They go through the same process. So we have a basic training with them of 15 days before they start the facilitation. So after 15 days of the training, they go back uh, to their community. Of course, they look at also the selection criteria of people they are going to bring in the group. So then they go back, they look into their community and sometimes they work with the leaders, the local leaders, be it the church leaders, uh, the local authorities. Uh, they look at the community, they do a kind of screening and they look at who they can invite for social therapy groups. So then they invite them and they run also the 15 session uh, with, uh, with the groups and uh, throughout the process, we also work closely with them to, um, to help them to understand, they share with us what comes in the group, we help them to understand. We take it as a, we, we have a, a learning by doing principle, uh, so whereby uh, they learn while facilitating groups, but we also learn from them uh, during those kind of exchange meetings that we organize with them. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, but I don't want to forget this important point, and uh, Susan Galena, you will help me. Uh, I want to make sure that any of our colleagues who wish to learn more about community-based sociotherapy have knowledge and access to the program. So we'd like to provide them, whether it's your website or it's other online uh, discussions about this process, we'll make sure we get this information to people, as well as perhaps if you were kind enough to share with us um, a course outline in a very general sense, so people can better understand uh, the substance of the program as we talk about it more generally. So we'll, we'll circle back and make sure that that is provided to all of you as we go through uh, today's conversation. Um, I'd like to get more specific for a couple moments. 
and you have uh, just a, a screen full of uh, experienced, uh, uh, well-meaning, uh, capable activists, if you will, uh, from Ukraine, those that want to uh, get busy when presented the opportunity, what would be the first steps that people would go through to try and move in the direction of establishing some community-based sociotherapy programs within a particular community? Um, yeah, like you rightfully said, um, we are going to provide some documents as well, including also an implementation guidance, which is going to be open access. So we make sure that, that people will receive that. Um, and then from there, what is very important is to really look at what are the needs in the community. Of course, the whole idea of community-based social therapy is that it's community-based, so it should not be a blueprint. Um, but it can be a source of inspiration for communities in different contexts that can be, and then the approach can be adapted according to those needs in the communities. But what I would say, if you really first start small, let's say, then um, <coughs> really reflect on what is possible in your own neighborhood to do. There are always also other people who want to collaborate and connect and try to look for, for people who have like the same intention in terms of recovering from, from the war and, and finding each other to, to find ways of um, rebuilding the social uh, fabric like you uh, um, in the communities. And yeah, then I think um, based on that, uh, really see what are the, the like the strengths in the communities and um, assess them and build on that to make sure that you develop a kind of approach which can be suitable for the Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, communities. What are some of the challenges that people can expect to confront? What have you found as you've implemented this in different communities to be some of those? anticipated challenges and how do you how did you overcome them yeah, i think uh, of course people initially will be hesitant maybe to join events or activities or groups with people with different backgrounds whom they could maybe perceive as they are like enemies in the past or maybe still so there might be suspicion there's like maybe a lot of mistrust uh, for people to join those activities. So I think that is also what happened here in Rwanda in the, uh, in the beginning. But at the same time, you see that people are really sometimes in this, having the same needs. The needs for feeling safe in your own community, the need for being able to trust people around you and feeling that, yeah, your community is carrying you, let's say, and recognizing you and respecting you. So, uh, you, yeah, very often what we've seen, even people with such a different experiences, for example, in the genocide, actually their, their essential needs, which I would consider to be part of basic needs, actually, are so similar sometimes. So I think that's what can be found in those groups. And um, I think you also probably have some good challenges. Yeah, um, uh, some uh, additional challenges to what uh, Angela said. Uh, in some communities, uh, it is quite challenging to also find those safe spaces because uh, they have to be in the same community. So you don't take people far from, I mean, away from their communities. So you need to find those safe spaces or places where people can uh, be gathered without making a long distance. So here we sometimes uh, use like the churches, uh, we use the schools, or uh, we can even use uh, uh, the, the houses of like the survivor, a survivor who survived alone, who doesn't have anyone uh, with just with her in the same house. So then they feel also happy when they see uh, people coming and meeting uh, at their house uh, every week. So, uh, but sometimes it's quite challenging to find those places in, uh, in that community. Uh, and also um, uh, sometimes it is, heavy to the facilitators. Uh, because as I say, there are also wounded healers, uh, but what is shared in the group, it's really heavy uh, on them. 
So, and if it is not well handled, it can also cause some harm or damages on their lives. So it's really very important to consider that uh, when uh, we have this kind of community-based uh, intervention, just to make sure that there's also time to help the facilitators who are running those, uh, those groups to make sure that they remain healthy uh, during the process. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. And you, your last comment raises another question. What can facilitators, what those people who have experienced the same trauma as those they are seeking to help, what techniques can you suggest for self-care? What can you do to help train people to take care of themselves so they can be uh, best able to help take care of others? I, yeah, one, I, uh, as I said, during the training, we help them to have, um, uh, to go with, let me say, enough energy to, to serve uh, the groups, that's one. And uh, uh, throughout the process, we also uh, organize uh, intervision uh, for them. We organize some exchange meeting. We organize uh, the psychological supervision uh, for the facilitators. Uh, we do believe and or we have really observed that all those spaces for the facilitators also help them to keep running uh, groups without being much uh, affected by, uh, by them. Yeah. Yeah, so here we also really bring in this group element again, bringing mm. the facilitators together and also going through the, that process. Fabulous. When you were talking about safe spaces and using churches and schools, I'm reminded uh, Susan and I collaborated with Rotary Club International and other organizations and went to a community uh, ceremony in a small village outside of Kigali in Rwanda, where they, they built a community center uh, with a kitchen and meeting rooms, and it became a safe space for much of this kind of activity. I'll talk more about that uh, if the opportunity arises, but uh, creating those safe spaces, as you know, is so essential to trying to move on to the next uh, levels of, of teaching and sharing. Um, how many um, participants have been through this program of community-based sociotherapy in Rwanda? to this point? How long has your program been in effect and how many people have come through this program? Uh, yeah, um, CBS and uh, ICBS are not only the organizations that are uh, using the approach. Uh, there are other organizations, of course, it's easy to know the numbers that, numbers of people who attended our intervention interventions yeah, but there are others from uh, other organizations. But for us, more than 50,000 of people have attended uh, our groups. Yeah, but as I say, there are also more others uh, from other organizations. And those uh, the numbers that I have said, they come from the local communities and the others come from the prisons because we also work in prisons. Uh, we also work uh, in schools, universities, and uh, secondary school because we are also uh, uh, aiming at uh, breaking the cycle of violence and also intergenerational legacies. I mean, the trans, uh, the way we really observe that uh, the legacies of genocide and trauma are also being transmitted from the first generation to the generations after. So we, that's why we also focus on, on the schools, universities, and uh, prisons, as I said, and uh, refugee camps. Uh, so yeah, so all the numbers that I said, they come from those different uh, settings. To put it in perspective, I was just doing the math in my head. If uh, you, your program has touched the lives of more than 50,000 people and other programs are also working, and there's, I think, 10 million people in Rwanda. I, I, I think you, you've touched the lives of more than 1% of the population, with the, which is a huge inroad, to be sure. Uh, as I listen to you talk about interrupting the cycle of future violence, do you have programs that are unique for children 
where you have uh, young members of society participating in a program with their peers as opposed to being with adults? Um, you mean for us as CBS or in general in Rwanda? Either, either way. Yeah, I think for us as CBS, we mainly work with youth um, because we do see that the community-based social therapy approach as such um, cannot really be applied let's say at primary school, but we do use it at secondary school and uh, now also at, uh, at university level. Um, and it has some particular elements also of addressing this uh, like intergenerational transmission of trauma. And also what we've seen, we've done a study about communication within families about the past and how complex it is for parents to share about the history from both sides, of course, but children, they they knock on the door of their parents and they ask, okay, why do I not have a grandfather? Or why is my father not with us? And then it's up to the mother to explain that the father has been imprisoned because of participating in a genocide, for example. And these are very difficult conversations, of course. Or what you often hear is that families say, ah, it's because of your neighbors that your father is not here. So either, when if the father is, for example, killed during the genocide or because the father is in prison, so, or the mother. So these conversations are so difficult uh, to have in, 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 in families. And that's also something that we are working on as CBS to see how, yeah, to support parents in uh, like moderating these discussions with their children. Fabulous. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Uh, also, um, we, are, we are talking of uh, the, direct participants but uh, for us we also take uh, those families or those children as uh, indirect uh, participants because uh, when a parent has participated in um, in social therapy and she get or he get words to tell the story uh, to the family to the children uh, at the end we find that their children are also uh, helped by the approach uh, somehow because uh, sometimes they report the change that happened in the family, that happened in the lives of their children, uh, the lives of their partners and, uh, and the neighbors. So then we have both direct participants, but we also consider and do the follow up on, uh, on the indirect participants. And maybe if I can add, because you were mentioning the epigenetics so there's indeed also a biological transmission for example when the baby is in the womb and the the, the mother goes through a traumatic event it has indeed a, an influence on how the dna expresses in further in future life that's the epigenetics but there are other also other ways in which in, the trauma is kind of transmitted and that is of course in terms of when it comes to parenting so attachment like parents having difficulties to really yeah, connect and uh, yeah, and have attach with their children. Uh, also when a parent, him or herself is, is depressed, it has an influence of course at, uh, in, the, in the family. And also these yeah, uh, social, and as often you see that people, that families carry a kind of secret. And yeah, that is really felt within the children and some children say i don't know but i'm always angry i don't know where it comes from i'm always angry but they they don't know where to relate it to so all these days you, you see so many sentiments um related to a, a sense of depression uh, or trauma in the second generation who didn't go through the genocide themselves but who really experienced these consequences fascinating um, how scalable is this approach to community-based healing? How, how can you envision this? What is your experience in, in growing uh, this uh, approach to community-based healing? Give, give us some examples of, of um, what you see as possible. Uh, you've, you've mentioned, I think, earlier uh, in your initial comments, Angela, about other countries that are trying to adopt this now. But what do you see as the potential for this approach? Yeah, um, uh, uh, the approach has started in 2005 uh, in Rwanda, 
uh, it was just a very small pilot project. Yeah, but from what uh, came uh, out of the intervention itself, uh, people got interested, different organizations, different communities, uh, they got interested and they have been calling uh, people to come and also help in their communities. So then uh, people started to scale up the, the intervention in Rwanda, in other areas. So it went to one, two, three districts until uh, we started to scale up uh, the intervention in other countries. Uh, like now we, we are having groups in uh, South Sudan, in, uh, in DRC, um, in Uganda, Liberia, we have, been, uh, we have been there, Ethiopia. So uh, just from the effectiveness of, of the approach and uh, uh, what, what is reported in different uh, studies that are done, so people go to get interested and they take the approach to uh, their communities. Yeah, so, yeah. And in, in this experience, Diojan, uh, it, does it transcend much of the um, uniqueness of different uh, communities? In other words, can it be applied across a variety of communities successfully in your experience? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, it, it really requires uh, much attention because the more you think of uh, scaling up uh, the approach, uh, the more risk of also losing the quality. So because it's really uh, an intervention or an approach uh, where people need to learn from everything, uh, where people need to adapt the approach, because as Angela said before, it is really very context uh, driven, uh, but at the same time, people need to keep the quality of, of the intervention. So then there's really that risk that the more people scale, scale up the intervention, uh, it may lose the quality if we don't pay attention. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, I do want to leave time for questions here shortly. I'm going to ask one other question before I open things up here. Um, how do you know that your program is successful? I mean, obviously, people will tell you things anecdotally coming out of the program, but do you do any kind of testing? Is there any kind of objective measurement uh, or, or ways to know what impact you're having in communities? Or is it just obvious? Yes. No, actually, we do a lot of uh, research as well. On the one hand, a little bit what you mentioned is qualitative research. So we work with most significant change stories, focus group discussions, interviews. But next to that, we also do uh, randomized control trials, which means that we have the control groups. These are usually groups of people that are on the waiting list to join community-based social therapy and also then the groups that are actually participating in the intervention. And then we do uh, a baseline study and an endline study among both groups. Uh, plus then the, the group that is on the waiting list that will start two rounds later. So then we also do another uh, like survey after, uh, like three months after ending the social therapy sessions. So in that way, we can really see whether there is a significant change between the control group and the intervention group. And next to that, uh, and yeah, that, that really has shown quite interesting and positive results. Uh, and then what we do, we don't use measures. We actually, we do also use measures which originate from Western societies, but we also develop measures. Uh, so surveys that really orig originate from the Rwandan society using the Rwandan concepts. Um, and yeah, for example, really building on, on what does it mean for um, a Rwandan to feel psychologically well. So what are indicators in this context? And then we develop questionnaires um, using indicators that they give as a community. So, and yeah, in that way we, com uh, we compare then the, the baseline and the end line and the intervention and the control group. And next to that, we do a sort of outcome mapping because of course things can happen in someone's life and it's, you can't always attribute the, the changes to a single intervention. It's not an isolated thing happening in someone's life. 
So we also do this outcome mapping, which means that you look at different changes in one's, someone's life and really identify which changes can be attributed to social therapy as an approach. Sounds like it's a thoughtful blending of Western psychometric testing, both before and after, uh, overlaid by culturally specific indicia of how people are doing. And uh, um, let's do this. Let, let's open uh, the floor to questions for people. I'm sure I've had the privilege of, of sort of asking uh, much that comes to my mind, but I want to hear what's on others' mind this evening as you listen uh, to our guests. Galena, do you want to, there are a couple questions in the chat. If you would um, let us know, let the, um, everybody know what they are in English, that'd be great. Oh, I don't hear you. Oh, it's the interpreters. Thank you. Uh-huh. Як швидко після завершення збройних зіткнень оголошення завершення війни? So, uh, question number one: uh, How fast uh, after uh, the uh, conflict or uh, a war is uh, over uh, should uh, social therapy be started? Uh, that was the first question. I can announce the second question immediately, or we can uh, go one by one. Okay. Uh, let uh, uh, me ask the second question. So, facilitator is uh, uh, the one who is not interested in uh, either uh, result uh, of should be a person who is not interested in either result uh, of the uh, negotiations. Uh, uh, so, uh, the question is uh, how a facilitator can be effective if he or she is representing one of the groups uh, uh, which are taking part in the negotiations. Uh, so, let us stop here and proceed with the responses. Please, Angela, Diogene, however you wish to respond to those, please choose. Um, well, of course, uh, for the first question, there's not really a simple or arbitrary answer to it, actually. Uh, because, for example, we now also implement community-based social therapy in DRC, so in Eastern Congo, where actually war is still going on. Uh, somehow some communities are stable, but others are very mobile and um, yeah, there is a large um, internal di displacement community. So um, yeah, it really, it really depends on the context. Um, yeah, I would say you can, yeah, you can start when you feel a community is ready for it. Yeah, I, I, I really don't have a very clear, in all honesty, answer to this. Maybe do you can a better answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, of course, as, as, as I said before, we are also working in, uh, in the refugee camps. Uh, but, but as, and as you know, those people are also out of their, their homes because of, uh, of the war. And the war is somehow still there. Uh, I think when in a specific community, there's a, uh, it's possible to create uh, safe spaces because sometimes when there are bombs that are, that are sharing, it's almost impossible to have even those safe spaces. So it's important to look at uh, that the, the status uh, of the wall, of, of the after the wall, Though it's, as I said before, it's difficult to know, okay, so when is the after the war also start? So you, it's also difficult to know uh, because uh, it may stop uh, in some minds of people or in the community while it still goes on uh, in the minds of other people. So it's really important for the, the same community, the same people to define or to define when themselves they feel the community is ready for uh, those safe spaces. So it's, it's context uh, related. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do those answers then address the question, I think? Yeah, uh, there's also there's a question about uh, a facilitator being part of also yes. uh, uh, the negotiating sides. 
So uh, I, I would say that in our groups, uh, we had the facilitators who come from the survivors, uh, while in the groups we had also the, the perpetrators. Or a facilitator coming from the perpetrator side, while in the group, they are also survivors. So it happened. So what is important is that the facilitator himself or herself is able, so he feels that energy to sit there in the group, I mean, as a, a neutral uh, person. That's possible when uh, he has or she has been facilitated in the recovery uh, process, her, her or himself. Uh, that's very important. And two, um, sometimes the, the group also questions the facilitator. So it's important that that is also brought in the group and people discuss that. They also look at how they see the facilitator. So there's no problem uh, from that because they know the facilitator in the community. It's not someone coming from, some, from, from far. It's from the community. So it's also possible that they discuss uh, what they think or how they feel about the facilitator. So, and that slowly reduces the perceptions that they may have uh, on the facilitator. Yeah. It's almost, that, as, though, it's almost as though having uh, someone from the community who's gone through that experience is both a catalyst and an authentic voice in the conversation. And that yeah. obviously um, in, in an imperfect world, you have to measure that type of person from somebody coming from a distant community who can't bring any of that uh, local knowledge or, or that authentic uh, sense of, of feeling. Um, other questions that have come up that people would like to address? Galena. Um, we know that the first step is very important and the most difficult one. How do you invite people to that conversation? What, how it looks like from the perspective of the process? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, during our trainings, uh, we also make sure that we, we look at uh, the, the communities together with the facilitators to understand, okay, so who should be part of, uh, of the group? Uh, so then when the, commu the community facilitators go back home, uh, they visit uh, those uh, potential uh, participants. They visit them at home and they interest them to join the group, but they avoid to label them as people who have mental problems. So then they invite them as essential or important people to, in the group who can contribute not coming that they have because they have problems, but we invite them as people who can also contribute to the group. And it is also the case because everybody in the group has what he can give, but he also has, has what he can get uh, from the group. So then we avoid reporting them as people with mental problems, people with problems, uh, people in conflict and whatever. So we invite them as important people and they can accept to come, but they may also refuse to come. They have that right of accepting or refusing and we inform the facilitators that they should really accept any decision that can be taken by the community members either to join or not to join. But from our experience, uh, we really didn't have um, many uh, people who refuse to to join. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. More questions. Uh, welcome, Dimitro. Yes. Colleagues, good evening, speaker. I have a few questions. If you want, I can start with the first. 
для, для вимірювання безпосередньо соціальної згуртованості в громаді, яка пережила фактики військового конфлікту, існує індекс соціальної згуртованості і примирення. Ну, це такий аналітичний інструмент, саме розробка. Instrument uh, which is used in social science, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, community cohesion uh, uh, index. Uh, uh, so my question is: uh, uh, Do you use uh, uh, such a, a measurement, and uh, what is uh, uh, the indicators uh, before and after? Uh, yes. Um, so actually, we do indeed also. Oh, sorry. I think you heard the question, Angela. Yeah. So no, indeed, uh, we do use uh, different measurements, which are already validated instruments. For example, you have the PHQ-9 uh, that's, uh, that measures depression, but also you have the community social cohesion skill. Um, and, and different of those already or social capital uh, skills that have already been uh, tested and are recognized actually worldwide. But what we've learned is that sometimes some of those questions, they really um, uh, are very differently interpreted here in Rwanda, for example. Simple question, if you ask a question which I think is part of the SRQ uh, self-reporting questionnaire, is your daily life suffering? So the way, for example, I would interpret it in, as someone I'm originally from the Netherlands, if in that context would be very different from here in Rwanda. People will say, yes, if, if it rains a lot and my harvest has, has gone because of the weather, because of the rain, that's, the day, that's when my daily life is suffering. So the relationship that people um, uh, have with these questions is very different from how they are intended in more Western to be, uh, or what is their definition intended to be in more Western oriented societies, for example. And that's why we really build on, um, on the, the wording and the indicators from the communities here in Rwanda. And, uh, and, uh, uh, it's also important to understand how people uh, describe their suffering. Yeah. So the way it is described in a specific community is different from uh, how it is described in a uh, Rwandan community or uh, other communities. If I can just give a, a, a small example, I, I remember uh, one of uh, the survivors who had been raped uh, during genocide we had in our group was of course still uh, struggling with um, the, the consequences of genocide. When uh, she was describing how, uh, I, I mean, how her suffering was like, uh, she was talking about how she was feeding the maggots uh, in, her, in her mind, in her brain. So the maggots are those small insects that uh, come from uh, uh, this rotten uh, food. So it's difficult to scientifically uh, prove how someone can have the maggots in the brain or in the mind or saying, okay, so I was having a big stone on my heart mm -hmm. and during the session, the, I felt the stone breaking and I, I no longer feel that stone there. So, so you see, you can't really uh, uh, prove how someone can have a stone on the heart, but you understand what it means. So what do maggots in the brain? The maggots are found in a, in a rotten material or food. So then if someone is talking about the maggots in, in her life, he doesn't or she doesn't see herself as a, 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 a living person. She takes herself as a dead person. That has what it means in, in her life. So it's important to consider how the community describes uh, the suffering that they are having uh, after the violence. Yeah, thank you.
Let me um, make a suggestion uh, because we are a bit short on time. Uh, Angela, Dajen, uh, would, would it be possible to impose on you a bit further after the program concludes? If people have follow-up questions, could we submit those perhaps by email to get a response? Uh, yes, you can tell you have, I think, lit a fuse of, of, of interest, if not inspiration, and I'm sure there will be more uh, to follow. But as we conclude our conversation, I try and leave our uh, friends and colleagues, many of whom, like the trainers that you train, uh, all have their own experiences and suffering at some level. What can you leave them with in terms of an optimistic note based on your experience with community-based sociotherapy? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's unfortunate that we don't really have uh, enough time. Yeah, but uh, our experience in social therapy has really have really taught us that it is possible. It is possible to repair relations. It is possible to heal hearts of people after violence, after traumatic experiences, and that contribute to breaking the cycle. Uh, of violence, as, uh, as I said. So one may ask, ask me, why do we keep uh, observing or experiencing wars and violence uh, every, I mean, in many corners of, of the world? Uh, but I would say that uh, doing something uh, for us uh, is always better than doing nothing. So you never know how it can be if we do nothing. So, and I'm really happy that we are now uh, thinking of uh, the after war in, in Ukraine. So thinking about it before is very important and that also gives hope uh, for the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Angela, did you have a final thought as well? Yeah, I think that what I've also really learned from the social therapist is that Many people think that they can't really make a change in someone else's life. That was also the thought of many of the community-based facil uh, social therapy facilitators. But this program has really proven that no matter how small your actions can look like, they can really have an impact on the people around you. So really your actions matter and also your voice matters and it can have an impact. And I think that's also what community-based social therapy in Kia Rwanda is and it means heal me, I heal you. So I think, yeah, that there's so much beauty in this, in this phrase and it shows that you have the power to help someone else, but also that you can recognize that someone else next to you can have the power to help you. Thank you. Um, your words are powerful. We know that life is experiential. Uh, one of Susan and my most enduring memories was visiting a small rural village uh, miles from Kigali, where this community center had been built. And during the opening ceremony, they gave testimonials from people who stood up in front of the group and shared their stories. And uh, most memorable at the end of that program was uh, a man who uh, was a violence perpetrator who had killed a neighboring family. And he stood with the survivor, the only survivor of that neighboring family who had been killed. And they had avoided each other, as you say, walking around their village since he had gotten out of prison. And yet by being brought together and sharing their stories and promoting healing in this community center, they were able to fashion a business to work together and at least at some level move forward in their lives. And it was really, uh, inspirational in terms of the promise it held for both their future and what was possible. So I commend you both for your life's work. It's fascinating. It's inspirational. Um, and uh, um, look forward to staying in contact, really, uh, to hear more about the great things that you're doing. And I'm sure for all of our uh, friends from Ukraine, they thank you as well for sharing all of that inspiration with them. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you too. for offering this space. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
All right. So we will uh, uh, provide the information that we have told you we will, meaning how to get in touch with Angela Dirjan uh, to find out more information about how uh, community-based social therapy can be implemented, what it looks like in more detail. And as they've uh, so graciously agreed, they will uh, stand ready to provide some additional support and answering questions. But thank you, everybody, this evening. We wish you safety and good health uh, as we look forward to continuing our program. But it's nice to be reconnected. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.